So why do you do podcasts? Why does everybody do podcasts nowadays? It is one of the most impactful things I do. It's unbelievable. Even if I wanted to craft, I don't think in video. Yeah. Do fine I just stuff. yeah, I just don't. That's just not how my mind works. As far as uh, natural uh, aligning natural gifts and abilities with what you do. I'm so glad I debunked the whole if you work hard you can be good at anything thing because it's just not true. I debunked it in engineering school. I'd never ever ever worked as hard as I worked in school to pass circuits mm-hmm. and I got a D in circuits. Like I put in twice as much effort into that class than I'd ever put in anything before and I got a D and then I'm like okay. So it's actually false that you can just work hard and get A's. Yeah. That that is a that's total bullshit. Which is a good lesson. And I think it's probably the only lesson you can learn firsthand. You mm-hmm. know, you can I think you can always tell people. Just like, you know, sometimes you're just not built to be good at this thing. No. But it's, you really need to learn like, oh wow, I busted my and I still do not have it. Well, it's, it's like a fun concept to think like if you just work hard, you can do anything. Like, get yeah, kind of, but also, I can work really hard playing basketball and never make the NBA. Like, there's just no. Everybody. Welcome uh, to Billet Vlog. This morning we are in Salt Lake City, Utah, outside of Salt Lake City, Utah, just south of the airport here, outside of Wheeler Machinery, uh, the Utah cat dealer. So today we are here to record. It's a landfill compactor pulling in. Looks like it's burned. Hold on. Hold, please. Oh, yeah. She's going in for a little TLC. So our Wheeler Machinery, we are here to record two podcasts. Alex is here, Chell's here, recording podcasts with Jonathan Campbell, one of the dealer principals here at Wheeler, and then Ryan Goodfellow, Mr. Rock Structures himself. We're also gonna check out what Wheeler does day to day in their shops. This is one of my favorite dealers to visit. I am slightly biased, and you'll figure out why as we get into the podcast, but definitely one of my favorite shops. It's an amazing facility, amazing yard, all sorts of equipment. They do some really cool stuff, not just rental equipment, construction equipment, but also mining style uh, projects. Last time I was here, they were building 794 beds for Rio Tinto Kennecott. So a lot of cool stuff going on all the time here, and I'm excited to check it out. guys to get everything set up but we're here in a conference room we got the history of wheeler machinery right behind me and we are about to cut a podcast with jonathan campbell who is executive vice president of the dealer campbell companies overall so we're gonna meet with him and then following jonathan we are going to be talking to mr ryan goodfellow of rock structures
for sure. Cool. All right, well, that was uh, Ryan Goodfellow, everybody. Oh. Oh. Doink. That's a lot of podcasting. A lot of podcasting. That's great. Ryan. Okay, so why does everybody do podcasts nowadays? It is one of the most impactful things I do. Really? It's unbelievable. People feel like they know you. It's just really? so much more intimate and so much more long form. It's really interesting. It makes sense. And I, I didn't appreciate that until I started doing it. And especially we have an internal podcast. Mm-hmm. And that's been yeah. extremely important as we've hired so many people. Yeah. Because they can get caught up to speed on how I think oh, and yeah. how we've true, designed huh? the business. Uh-huh. And I don't have to say things twice. They can just go back and listen to it. So I bring, I say something on an internal podcast today. We hire someone next week. They go back and listen to that. So now they're getting the benefit of, and then not only that, but they, they, they can go way back and see, yeah, they had a podcast about this, like never do this. And then three months later, they're saying, do that. And they're starting, they, they can see how the business has transitioned as yeah. well. We yeah. had two weeks in a row where Aaron put out a podcast about time track. time track. And he was like, hey, we're going to be doing it this way. The next week, it was like, never mind, don't do that. But like to me, like that is a nice time capsule of like where we were. And it's valuable to know why we tried the one way, but do this other way now. It's kind of like journaling. Yeah, it really is. But the whole company is kind of like a part of it. And it just makes us feel together since, you know, everybody's all over the place. Good to see you, Ryan. Good to see you. I think you were less nervous than I was when I did mine. Less nervous? Yeah. What do you have to be nervous for? I don't know. I I recorded with him a couple weeks ago in Mm -hmm. Nashville. And it was like, I was excited to do it. And then we sat down to record and I was like, why am I so nervous? This is stupid. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's like, it's one of those things where you don't want to say something wrong. But then again, really, what does it matter? Yeah. Yeah, so you just tell me which way you want to go and then what questions you have along the way. So as we go through the doors here, what we'll do is is we'll walk. The very first shop shop that we're going to enter is the Component Rebuild Center. It's where we rebuild all of the engines, powertrain components, wheels, final drives, things like that. Okay, all right. We'll go straight back to the, we call it uh, heavy equipment operations. So a lot going on here, right? I mean, usually, so this, clo- this, this area of the shop is the component rebuild center. Usually a dust-free environment for the most part, right? Um, you can see there's a lot of parts and staging that's going on out here. Our parts warehouse, thanks Eddie. Our parts warehouse is uh, at the saturation point as well. It's kind of overflowing into the, the main area out here. This is our condition monitoring center in here. That's where they monitor all of equipment health. Okay, so those are uh, condition monitoring analysts. You'll see them sitting at those, those um, screens and whatnot right there, and they are monitoring all the equipment that we have out there that is, that is connected assets, is what we call them. They're, they work in conjunction, like you'll see right here, with the fluid analysis, the inspections, the equipment management, site conditions, um, and the electronic monitoring. It is kind of a mess out here because we're remodeling this whole bottom area. This is our new oil lab. Oh, oh, really? Yeah. Whoa, that's pretty cool. Isn't that neat? Yeah. So we're quadrupling the size of the current oil lab that we have now. Holy smokes. So the oil lab we have now is up and tucked away into the to the back floor up there. This is the new oil lab right here. That's, so, that's big time. Yeah, it is. Wow. It's huge. So this is what we call our main shop over here. From Service Bay 5 all the way over to Service Bay 13 is our sales rent shop. And so um, this is where all the new equipment comes in and all of the equipment that comes off of rent. Um, that's where we get it ready to go. So rental load. returns, pre-delivery inspections, things of that nature, all on this side. From Service Bay 4 over, all of these and our pieces of equipment are customer owned, okay? So this is where all the major repairs are taking place. All of the rebuilds that we were talking about take place. That's all over here. So what we'll do is we'll work our way back to, and I'll show you where we're building. We've got the 980 going back together, and then the 777 that's coming apart. That's pretty cool. How many rebuilds do you guys typically do nowadays? On what month? Yeah, true. <laughs> um, 
I want to say last year, I'd hate to even say, I could find out. Um, but we've got rebuilds not only in this shop, but all of our other branch locations as well, mm. right? So right now we have these two rebuilds as well as another. So this here's a 980 that's going back together. You can see he's putting the, the axles back in. The engine's already set in. This is a 777 that's coming down. Okay, so we've got the panels off, the body's off. <clears throat> They're in the middle of pulling this apart now. This particular one, this is a repair return, and so we're just pulling out the engine transmission torque converter on this one, and then repair others as needed. We do also perform undercarriage work, so this is a roller frame that's here that's being rebuilt now. We also perform all of the uh, regrousering as well as the um, track work over on the other side of that wall. That's right. Yeah. It's amazing how much you guys do here. So uh, we do a little bit of everything. You'll pull the engine and then the engine will go next Correct. Time. Yeah, and so we'll remove the engine, the transmission torque converter from this machine here. That will come out and it will go straight over to the CRC and we'll walk through there where that, all that will be torn down on one area which is separated from the rebuild area, mm -hmm. right? Contamination control. Yeah. And so, yeah, that'll be pulled out of there, goes directly over there, gets rebuilt, gets certified, gets dynoed, and then gets put right back over here and that's how we reinstall it and send it out to the customer. It's pretty neat. It is pretty neat. You couldn't shoehorn another piece of equipment in here Yeah, today. yeah, you guys are chock full right now. We are busy. Man. We are busy. And this doesn't count all the equipment that's outside. We call it the solar bay. Mm -hmm. So when we can't fit it into the main bay, we call it a solar bay. And then we also have more pieces of equipment that are on their way in. Wow. It's a big excavator right there. It's, it's busy. Yeah. You haven't even seen the east building. Yeah. <laughs> we have a whole additional building just to the east of us here where all the light equipment is. This is about as large as we can fit in rolling into the shop, mm -hmm. right? As far as height and width. Mm -hmm. You can see that we're, uh, call it threading the needle, oh, right? Yeah. yeah, for sure. <laughs> so it's about as large as we can get in here. It's impressive enough that we can get it through the door, but um, as when we go out to the back, you'll see what those look like. And they're in what we call a shipping configuration, right? And so what you're going to see is, is you're going to see a frame. You're going to see the cooling package in the frame. You're also going to see the powertrain in there as well as the struts. But the wheels, the tires, the axles are all removed. They're just too big yeah. to transport that way. And so, but you'll see if you look at the, you know, you look at the axle on this, comparatively speaking, and then you can look at the axle here. And that's quite a bit larger. Wait till you see the axle of those out there. Yeah, yeah they're huge. What we'll do is we'll make, we'll snake our way through there. We'll walk out the back. I'll show you where we've done the 793D trucks and then we can work our way back in here and we can, I can show you whatever you want. If you want to see some of the smaller stuff, it's over on the other side based on how much time you have. Sure. Then we can go through the CRC. You can see where the components get torn down and put back together. Sounds good. Sounds okay. good? Yeah. All right. So, whoa. What is this, you ask, right? Yeah. That right there, see where that motor grader's pulling in right now? Mm -hmm. That's our wash bay. That wash bay has looked like that. It looked just like that 26 years ago when I started. This is our new WASP building, okay? WASP stands for wash, sandblast, and paint. All right, and so what you're looking at here is going to be our new wash bay. We're doubling the capacity of our, of our wash, plus it'll be indoors. That next bay that you see right there, that's where we're going to be performing all of our sandblasting. Right now, we do it on the back side of the property. Okay, it's out in the open, it's hot, it's not environmentally friendly. We're putting it underneath roof, rooftop now. That right there, see that building with the faded sides on it? That's yeah. our current paint booth. We're quadrupling the size of our paint booth now. And so right there, that's where they're going to stand that other wall up. That's where our paint is going to go. That's big so, time. We're going to keep that paint booth as overflow. We're talking about maybe um, performing our trailer work over there, which we're currently doing in the East Building, but that's going to be performed right over here. Wow. So, wash, sandblast, paint. Wow. So, again, right now our paint operations are in that building. We do glass right here as well. That's what all this is that you see. So much. This here on. is our uh, training institute. Okay, so this is where we bring our service training level technicians in, as well as our apprenticeship program lives and dies out of this building here. Right now, this is CRC staging, and so that'll be until this building gets done, then it'll move back over where it needs to go. So some of the equipment will come in, you see like these wheel groups right here, 
these axles right here, some of the other engines over there that come in there for right now because the uh, we're building that building there. They come in here before they go into the, be rebuilt in our component rebuild center. Look at these cylinders too. <laughs> uh, those are massive, large mining shovel uh, cylinders. What do they have up at Kennecott? They're 6060s? I think they have uh, 6060s, uh -huh, along with their rope shovels. And so you see all these connexes right here? Yeah. Those are all full of pre-ordered parts for our rebuilds. That's how much work we have right now. Hey, come stand next to these for some scale. Do you even cylinder? Hydraulic power. Yeah, and the idler. Okay, so these are the 793D trucks. You can see is at front of the cab that's right there, yeah. right? So, you guys remember that 777 axle that I was showing you? There's the difference between what that looks like and what one looks like comes out of a D truck. So this is ready to ready to go. Yep, so this is shipping configuration. These were from Kennecott? So these particular machines came from Kennecott. We rebuilt them and now they're on their way up to Canada. And then the wheels and tires are right behind them. Yeah, the broom next to a tire. I'll take one. I have to pick up pick up my machine from the cat dealer tomorrow. What were you getting service? My brother broke the door. Oh. What happened? He pulled the little red handle on the door. That's one time use <laughs> in case it gets stuck. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Good practice. It's just and he'd been in and out of it a bunch, so it's just like, God, Tyler. All right, so to give everybody a better explanation as to what's going on, we are with Mr. Jeff Foreman. What's your title, Jeff? General Manager of Product Support Operations. That's a, that's a yeah. mouthful. You say general, you just say General Manager of Service. Jeff Foreman, General Manager of Service, is walking around Wheeler Machinery's operations today. It's a... Uh, it's a it's an amazing operation. I'm not just saying this because you're here. Definitely one of my favorite dealers to check out. We check out a lot of dealers. We were just at one the other day. Uh, check out a lot of dealers across the United States, but Wheeler has something pretty cool going on. It's just the scale um, of the operation here is pretty amazing. So we just checked out the the shop, one of the shops. We just checked out the 793D haul truck rebuilds. They pulled those from Kennecott. They're about to get sent to Canada. We're wandering the yard right now. I could wander this place for days because there's so much fun stuff here. And then we're gonna go check out the uh, Component Rebuild Center, CRC, CRC. CRC. Oh, it's just, and it just has, it has special guarding all over the place. I mean, it's like, this is here by design to knock it off. There's that up there, that's to knock it off. It's, it's, you can just tell like if you compare this to a normal nine, yeah. it's so much more built up because it's just meant to get just clobbered. It's meant to get dirty. In a uh, landfill application, it's all about airspace, right? They're only allowed, have you guys know what that is? Okay, so it's, they're only allowed so much elevation and so they need to compact that as much as they possibly can. That's why they bring these dozers in to try and get it, all the trash to a certain area to get it in front of the compactors to get it pushed down. And so, just like he had explained, that's what all these bars and whatnot are for, is to knock all that trash away, because if not, it will and does get, get in and itself compacted into certain areas, right? And uh, people throw everything away. And so what gets in a landfill is pretty nasty stuff and it'll get, it'll get pushed in there, so. <laughs> so
So this is an 836 um, landfill compactor. This is what works in concert with that dozer that you saw over there. Right. Okay. This is doing more of the compaction. That, that's what that's doing. So it's missing the blade on the front. So it has a blade that can actually push the trash, just like that. Yep, that's its little brother. This is an 836, that's an 826. And so, but that's what you see. They call that big drum, that, let's call it a sheep's foot. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what it's using. It's trying to get down in there and push that trash down as compact as possible to reduce the airspace in a landfill. So air is money in a landfill, right? And that's what that does. And All right. are nasty. I like the little spikes on the top of the birds. Stupid seagulls. So this is kind of cool right here. I, I'm a big proponent of culture and leadership. See that guy steam cleaning that off? Yeah. That's our night shift team leader. Okay. So you see a guy doing something like that, it just is remarkable to me. It shows you what kind of culture that we have here, right? He could be in there, he could be sitting at a desk, he could be doing whatever, ordering parts and whatnot. Nah, he's getting that machine ready for his guys to bring in, make sure it's nice and clean, right? That's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. I love to see that. So we're coming into the CRC, the sideway. So these engines will come in looking like this. This is after they come out of the wash bay. Then they'll go in here into the sandblast bay. We have a person in here that will sandblast these things down. They can blast the harnesses and everything. They use a material that isn't um, abrasive enough to break down the harnesses. Right. So we'll bring the, the, uh, the, the components into here, right? And so whether it's engines, transmissions, powertrains, whatever, comes through the shop through that door, but comes from the outside through that door. And you'll see as they tear them down here, the flooring is a grating, right? And so the oils, the coolants, the contaminants and whatnot will drop through the grating, and that gets taken away into the other side of the shop and then it'll be retrieved by um, our, our mixed contaminants uh, third party. So we'll tear down the components over here. These are all the parts washers here for whatever. We can stand a block up in there and all the larger uh, what is, pieces. What is this out of? This is a 3516 is what they call it, right? So six and three quarter inch bore, okay? so. This would be equivalent to what was in that 793 that you saw out there, okay? okay? Same size engine. In fact, this is probably a, an engine um, as part of our exchange program that will go into that. Damn. Wow. Yeah. So you can see that whatever, once we tore it down, we saw that the block needed to be surfaced. So we sent that over to our sister company. They machined the, the block to give it a nice solid surface to go back together with. So these are the smaller bead blast machines here. You get smaller components, you get in there, you clean them up before they go back together. So right here, this is a 12 cylinder version of that larger engine that you saw that was torn down right there. That was a 16 cylinder. Let me show you guys the dyno. I think you'll get a kick out of it. So years ago, we had a dyno. It was on the other side of the corner over there where our transmission dyno is. It was 3000 horsepower at the time. Here about 10, 12 years ago, we rebuilt the whole facility. We found that that smaller dyno was a bit of a bottleneck, okay? So we moved the dyno over to this side and made two. So at the end of the day, this one is a 6,000 horsepower dyno on the left. It's a 1250 on the right. And so that way we don't have a smaller engine bottlenecking a larger one. Let me show you the control room. So this is Travis Cranendonk, he, he's our dyno operator up here. And so 1250 over here, right? Oh, we upgraded it to a 15. I couldn't remember, it started out as a 1250, we upgraded to a 15. So the smaller dyno over here and then the 6,000 horse over there. C175, 16? Yeah. Bulletproof glass that he has yet to test out. <laughs> that I know of anyway. <laughs> so you saw the 793D trucks that were up there. Yeah. These are the, the haul truck that replaced those, the 794. Yeah. That's what this comes out of. Yep. 
So we're trying to just, we pour the coals to it, right? I mean, we, he puts these things under full load and then through step loads, okay? To try and simulate real world operation. Nothing completely simulates real world operation, right? He can't simulate what a driver's gonna do at any given time or anything like that. Yeah. These particular engines right here, um, out of a 794, it's an electric drive truck. So it's a little bit easier to do it over here, but uh, puts a little more of a real world. But um, at the end of the day, the, we do the best we can to try and, we try to break it before, before we send it out. But it's really great, right? Because he's able to see um, if it produces any leaks, if we assemble anything incorrectly, he's able to find the obvious things, right? So the, the dyno's rated at 6,000 horse. That engine's 3,500 horsepower. And what's crazy is, is that's the dyno right there. Just that, that, that little red apparatus in the back there, that's the dyno itself. So, you know, you can't compress a liquid, right? And so it uses water through, that, through the veins in that dyno to put a load on that engine. Podcasting so people have uh, been drawn to it so much because it's so it's so much more real and authentic. It's harder to fake. Yeah. Because like an Instagram post, you can doll it up, or video, you yeah. can edit it, make things look. Whereas audio is just like two people talking. Yeah. And so you just you feel like you're a part of it. All right, everybody. That's our day wrapped up at Wheeler Machinery just had a meeting and then we're headed back to the airport to go home. Matt goes to Texas, Alex and I go to Nashville, Tennessee. Funny enough, Alex and I were on different flights coming here, but we're on the same flight going home. Uh, I'm on 75 hard right now. I've only done one workout, so I'm gonna try to get the second workout done. While we're at the airport, got my indoor workout done this morning, so I'm gonna be walking the terminals. And with that, we'll uh, see you on the next one. Thanks for tuning in, stay dirty. Let's go home.